luck, everyone. Run till it's ending. Yes, camera is ready. Give me an Finland, can you hear me? Numéro 5. Mesdames, Messieurs, bonsoir. Play like a viol del Reino Unido, boom, bada, bada, canto, lulu. We were watching the votes and the room was getting hotter and hotter and hotter. United Kingdom, seven votes. Germany, 12 points. Norway. You surprise and astound me. These are the ABBA group. Nana Moscow. Julio Iglesias. Serge Gainsbourg. Dana. There's going to be some celebrating tonight with the Irish party. The United Kingdom have done it again, and I'll take a small bet that this might well go to number one. What do you think of the standard of songs in recent years? Uh, very, very low indeed. We are unity, and we are unstoppable. Mum, Dad, five of us, we would all sit, we were glued to the television, which at those days was this side. Every year the Eurovision was a must. My mother forced me. No, she didn't force me. I really loved to watch Eurovision. You'd be sitting cross-legged on the carpet, writing down your favourite ones. And it, was a, it was a huge event. It was event TV. It was the very first time that Europe came together, as it were, on wings of song. The idea was to un unify and the continent with song, and all it made manifestly clear was how far apart we were. My favorite one of all would be probably Mouth McNeil, um, I See a Star. I see a star. And it was the same year that ABBA won. I like I win when the favorite Eurovision song of all has to be Waterloo. Waterloo. Volare. Volare. Oh, oh, beautiful song. Once there was a beautiful Italian song called Nono Letta. Nono Letta. Celine Dion for Switzerland. I mean, I love Celine Dion. Surprise! It's almost impossible, I think, to explain Eurovision to someone who doesn't know what it is or had never seen it before, because you've got to know how it got to where it is today. The ITA transmitter at Norwood, near the Crystal Palace in South London, and the Eiffel Tower in Paris. With typical French resource, they've made this tourist attraction serve as a TV aerial, too. There'd been a couple of dreadful wars, and it was the very first attempt by Europe to bring itself together. Now, how does it work? Well, have a look at the Eurovision control room in Brussels. It's a magnificent, foolish concept. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. You might say the same about the European Union. You might say the same about the Euro. This your first sight of France by direct vision on this lovely summer night. And up shoot the glittering rockets right over the heads of the crowd. Just like sport, music easily travels, so the EBU thought it would be a good idea to experiment with this, uh, ask, uh, in that case, composers uh, to come up with their best light music compositions and uh, let them compete. In 1956, when the first contest took place, the UK actually missed out on that one. The BBC were organising the British Festival of Popular Song. Everybody falls in love with someone 
why can't someone fall in love with me? Are you there, Birmingham? Yes, we're here. How's it coming through? Fine. What's the weather like up there? Oh, much better than it has been. Yeah, a little bit rainy down here. Windy, too. All my friends and my relations. Song number three, four votes. Good night, my darling. Good night, my dear. Que j'aime, tu m'as fait tant de peine. Y'a ce qui peut se casser le Italy were absolutely robbed in 1958. Domenico was fairly unique at that time for actually opening his arms out during the performance. Normally Italian singers stood there with their arms by the side, but given the song was about flying, you know, it was quite an inspired idea. di stare qua giù con te Sing, 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 little buddy Sing, sing, sing it Sing, little buddy, sing a song Don't remember that Sing, little buddy, sing your song Sing, help our love along Sing, little buddy, up above Sing a song of love Good evening, this is David Jacobs speaking from the Royal Festival Hall and alongside me in these boxes are ten commentators each interpreting the scene in their various languages and in just a few seconds the mistress of ceremonies miss catherine boyle will make her entrance and the show will begin tonight this program is being televised to no less than 14 countries sing me hi 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 sing me low, low, high, low. High, high, oh listen looking low, low, low. wondering why 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 comes tomorrow you won't want me back again to hold you tightly elke morgen zon of regen komen wij katting kategen hakje stik tak op de stoep korte rok met nauwe koep maar een blik verraad geen nee of ja waarom zingen al de jongens haar verlangen aan France had won twice and uh, really couldn't take it on again and so the BBC came along and said we'll do it because we've got this very nice set of new studios which we're just building called the television center and I think they wanted to show them off you see and it was I think the only time in its history that it's ever been done in a studio. Viewers in the United Kingdom will recognize this building 
but it'll be less familiar to the 75 million viewers from 17 other European countries. We decided that we'd try and make the uh, opening look show off, I think, the television centre. So we decided to uh, try and get a helicopter shot of the building approaching um, at night. The standard of the artists were very high in those days. There were people like um, Francoise Hardy from Monaco. Alain Berrier from France. Elle était si jolie que je and for Luxembourg was a Greek singer called Nana Muscuri. It all seemed to go pretty well until we got to the end and then there was a bit of trouble with the, with the voting. Song number four, Denmark, two votes. Well, hold on, Oslo, just one moment. I'm afraid I shall have to give, ask you to give those votes all over again because first you have to give the number on the board, then the number of the name of the country. Katie Boyle said, well, sort yourselves out and we'll come back to you later and get your, your voting. We will go on to Italy. When we got to the end, Switzerland and the Danes were running neck and neck. Well, now we have to go back to Norway for a very decisive vote. Norway come back on at the end of all the voting. And the second time round, the votes were completely different to the first time. Denmark, four votes. Song number 10, Switzerland, one vote. And that completes the vote of the Norwegian jury. It was a, a sort of bit of drawing a breath. 43, 43, I... Thank you very much. And the winner of the Eurovision Song Contest is Denmark with the song Dan Savisa. Uh, an investigation by the EBU afterwards has discovered that the votes they did award in the end were correct. I was uh, in the kitchen of our house and I was watching Eurovision on a black and white set and this beautiful young girl called Giliola Cinquetti came on the stage and I was totally mesmerized by her. It was just magical. Serge Gainsbourg always had women hanging all over him. Bridget Bardot would be hanging on to him and smoking Je Thème cigarettes or something. Jesus Christ. Et maintenant, deux chansons de langue anglaise d'ailleurs vont se succéder. C'est ça le tirage au sort. On va entendre maintenant A Man Without Love. A Man Without Love. Is only half a man. If you look back to the UK music scene in the 50s and 60s, UK were making some of the biggest music in the world, and yet that wasn't really coming through when it came to Eurovision. A man without love. I think it was our lovely head of department, Tom Stone, who thought he should wear the kilt. And I'm not too sure whether a lot of people in other European countries didn't find that a little bit uh, strange. For a man without love. Our end.
Archies look like they're from the decade previously. They're great songs, if you like, but sort of parlour songs. And it was really 67, they sent Sandy Shaw barefooted to just look like she belonged in the era that we were watching. Once upon a time, an English song for the first time won the Eurovision Song Contest. I was lucky enough to be the one who sang it. 67 was the flower power year. And the songs were great. A white shade of pale. If you go to San Francisco, they wear flowers in your hair. It was quite extraordinary. Every song was a winner. The age group which buys records <coughs> has got much lower in the last 25 or 30 years. And I believe that the standard of music has got correspondingly lower as the age groups got lower. No, really, really, but 30 years from now, the popular songs of today may be the popular songs then. With all due respect, I don't think that the songs that you've written will be heard of or be remembered or, or even thought about in 30 years' time. I was a songwriter in Tin Pan Alley, and the very first year that they really put in a, a contemporary singer, everybody entered the Eurovision with the exception of about four teams, which was John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Ray Davis, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, and uh, who was the other one? Pete Townsend of The Who. He would have punched you in the nose if you mentioned the Eurovision. Do you think, as Tom Stone said, that Sandy Shaw represents 1967? Well, she doesn't for me, but I don't suppose I count because I'm over 21. It's because she's a hit artist all over Europe, and this is what we want, a hit song for the Eurovision Song Contest. And this time we'll win it. It would seem to me that the BBC picked you for this year's contest because you're very big in Europe. They explained that to me, you know. They wanted someone that represented the young pop scene. And I thought that I was the best one, which is nice. Had a dream last night. He's Had a dream last night. He's now I feel so sad, so sad, so sad, so sad. She had a strange manager called Evie Taylor. You think I'm very hard on you, but I'm not. She's bringing me down. No, I'm not bringing you down, because you know it's the truth. And Evie says to me, I'm going to do something here. This is the night when we were performing the songs. I says, what do you mean? She says, I'm going to do something. The band started, bop, 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 and then Sandy started with the long note. And then Sandy said, stop. I've come in at the wrong time. Can we start again? And apparently, Evie had done something with the musician to, I don't know, but it, it stopped it. <laughs> and it was an attention getter. And to me, that was a winning thing. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Hier spricht Emil Kolbacher aus dem großen Festsaal der Wiener Hofburg. I think Evie tried it again at the Eurovision, and it never worked. Wenn du nur zu mir sagtest, ich bin verrückt nach dir. Her microphone didn't work at the beginning, if I remember rightly. The long note is silent. I wonder if one day that you'll say that you can. And I thought, oh no, she's going to be so nervous. Oh, it's going to be awful. She's going to be like, how can she sing now? It didn't put Sandy out. And she still did it, and she still did it brilliantly. But who kept, who kept the microphone off? I don't know. It's interesting. United Kingdom, seven votes. From the UK point of view, it wasn't needed. Puppet on a string, Gross Britannian. The music business was gigantic. But from the, the BBC point of view, it was very important. Like a puppet on the BBC were very keen to try and win the 1967 Eurovision Song Contest in order that they could stage the 1968 contest, which would be the first one to be broadcast in colour. We were basking in the limelight of being hit songwriters. Having conquered Europe, we decided to slaughter them this time and Phil, my songwriting partner, and he played about the piano. He said, I've written this for the Eurovision. And the title was, I Think I Love You. I Think I Love You. 
I think I love you. I think the world is fine if you will say you're mine. I said, what do you think? And I went, rubbish. He says, well, help it. And I says, well, it's five syllables. Why don't we call it congratulations and celebrations? And that's how it came about. And the two guitarists that played on the demos of congratulations, it was Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones. <laughs> They hate being associated with Cliff's congratulations. Two of the best guitarists in the world. Can you believe that? They were going, congratulations. And they thought, what's this load of nonsense? The UK press were wildly speculating who was going to come second to the UK. There was a real confidence about the UK's chances of victory. Cliff Richard was a big star. He had the support of the home crowd, and really there was nothing stopping him. He looks great. He's charismatic. The only thing Cliff couldn't do was dance. Congratulations and celebrations When I tell everyone that you're in love with me The UK were leading more or less most of the, certainly throughout the second half of the votes. Bill Cotton came along and says, up you two, you've won it again. And uh, Cliff's there and all excited. And then the vote, the last vote came in. I don't know how this happened, but this song won it. It came from nowhere. If you listen to La 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 La, I think there's 98 La La La's in it. It was a fix because Cliff had won this. There's various rumours that Franco desperately wanted to host Eurovision in Spain and bribe the judges. Those have always been denied by both the European Broadcasting Union and, unsurprisingly, the winner from Spain, Maciel. However, Cliff Richard remained open-minded. was a dictatorship when Lulu went on in that little pink dress. I mean, what a joyful thing to think of. It's almost like she's just stepped out of a mini and she's just swung onto these little European people and gone boom, bang, a bang. It's a great victory for, for the British in a year when everyone won. Ireland was going through economically hard days and in the north where I lived, very, very difficult days that we now call the Troubles. There were running battles every day. People were bewildered on newspapers all around the world all people saw of my town was street battles and friction and just really terrible things. <coughs> the song was very like a folk song and I was basically a folk singer. It was written by two amateur writers. They were compositors in a Dublin newspaper. And I was an amateur, I was at school. I had to go to Amsterdam with school books in my suitcase. I never opened them, mind you, but I did take them. <laughs> and I was a complete outsider. Did I think it would win? Absolutely not, because I didn't think I could win. Und wenn Sie schon glauben, Katja Epstein sang for Germany. Julio Iglesias sang for Spain. And I loved Mary Hopkin. She was a very big star. So the presumption was that Mary would win, and I was very happy with that, because I thought she was great. The moment we've all been waiting for. Diana. I was the last on. 
the little girl from Ireland on whom all our hopes are pinned. I just was talking to myself, uh, saying, don't forget the words, don't slip going down that slope. And the stool was not a stool, it was a cylinder with no footrest. So if you went too far, you fell off the back. If you didn't go up enough, you couldn't steady yourself. So practicalities. Snowdrops and daffodils, butterflies and bees, sailboats and fishermen, things of the sea. I remember visualizing the faces of family and friends back home in Derry. Five votes. Well, that certainly gets us off to a good start. I, I wasn't really interested in the voting. Irlande, votes. All of a sudden, the floor manager grabbed me by the wrist and started pulling me uh, to the stage. And Ireland has won. And I'm pulling against him. And he said, you know, come with me, you've won. And I said, no, no, I haven't won. I couldn't have won. And then Mary Hopkins said, you've won. Our own Dana has won the Eurovision Song Contest. From then on, it was like an unreal experience, uh, an out-of-body experience. <laughs> and of course, there was pandemonium. I can tell you here in Amsterdam, there's going to be some celebrating tonight with the Irish party. Ireland hadn't had too much international success. Ireland was still an emerging nation, I suppose. It had uh, a lot of poverty. Uh, the Celtic tiger hadn't roared, wouldn't roar for another may, maybe 10, 15 years. Smile on Saturday night, how about a big smile now? Ireland back then, you couldn't imagine that we'd ever win anything. You know, we were not bred to win. <laughs> We were bred, bred to lose and be downtrodden. So the fact that Europe decided Little Dana was the best song in Europe, it was enormous. It was like, you know, the whole country was en fait. There was jubilation. I mean, it was a very bright light in very dark days. <laughs> At last, Saturday comes and excitement begins to build. Backstage at the Gaiety fairly crackles with tension and it's all systems go. Of course, we're all very conscious that we're showing the face of Ireland to the world. The audience for this programme is estimated at something between 500 million and 1,000 million. Probably the largest audience ever for any entertainment programme. We'd like our country to appear to them as attractive and friendly and also efficient. Of course we're watching it. This was our showcase to the world. Good luck, everyone. Knock them dead. Thanks, Here we go. The BBC was tremendously supportive when Ireland had to host it because we had black and white television. We didn't have colour. Five seconds. Next? Bye -bye. Therefore, we didn't have colour cameras. And they were loaned by the British. It was done in a little theatre that I had, and which I had trod the boards, the Gaiety Theatre in, in Dublin, which was a little music hall. It took a boat, I suppose. If it took a thousand people, I'd be amazed. And if it had all the cameras and all the sound and all the commentary positions and everything, and the two presenters sat in a box, in a theatre box just by the side to present. And that was an example of how small it was in the early 70s. <laughs> Just your jack in the box, you know it ever box. I'm gonna bounce up and down on my swing. I tore your star when it stops. I'm just your jack in the box. Because for your love I do anything.
This Eurovision Song Contest has presented Luxembourg with its biggest security problem ever. The qualifying mechanic is that you're a member of the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union. So, for example, Israel is a member of the EBU, so it can participate. Some of the guards have even come from Israel itself, in case Black September terrorists try something this weekend. The concert hall was surrounded by soldiers, police, armoured vehicles. You know, an attack was expected. So with every available digit crossed for Cliff, here it is now for the United Kingdom, our entry. Just before the show starts, the floor manager says, please remain in your seats. When you're applauding, do not stand up, otherwise you may be shot, because we have to take care. And so that was a fairly nerve-wracking moment. Power to all our friends The music that never ends To the people we want See a star. Camera A ready. Camera A. Yes, camera A is ready. Pero estamos en Inglaterra, en el sur de Inglaterra, en Brighton, donde por una sola noche se va a celebrar el Festival de la Canción de Eurovisión 1974. 1974 produced more chart hits in the, the contest in the UK than perhaps any other year. Italian entry in 1974 was the closest I ever got, I think, with your vision to a song that felt like it's something that I would want to have written. An incredibly tragic, heart-wrenching piece of drama. John sang for the UK that year, but she was an established artist, and even then we were still having problems getting established artists to sing in the Eurovision Song Contest and risk being beaten. But she did get beaten. And I remember saying at the time, well, that's very plucky of Olivia Newton-John, you know. I can't uh, wait to see what's going to happen to her career now, probably downhill and she went to Hollywood, starred in Greece and became a huge international star. Which just shows that I know absolutely nothing. These are the ABBA group. They made their first record in 1972 and uh, if all the judges were men, which they're not, I'm sure this group would get a lot of votes. You'll see why in a minute. Their song is called... Oh, and it's Napoleon. Napoleon, no wonder their song is called Waterloo. This is Sven Olaf Waldorf, who's really entered into the spirit of it all, dressed as Napoleon, waiting for Waterloo by ABBA for Sweden. Watch this one. They came on and they knocked everybody out. The star-shaped guitar and the, and the stacky old silver boots. The whole thing just looked extraordinary. Oh, yeah. Not only was that like the first step in what became one of the most incredible, I think, pop careers ever, but the fact that it felt like a rock song, you know, and it wasn't a bouncy, typical... La Suède, bravo! Looking back now, of course, it seems fairly obvious that ABBA would win with Waterloo. No member of the British jury gave ABBA's Waterloo any points whatsoever. Sweden, five votes. Oy, oy, oy. Of course, we all think they were destined to win and they came fully formed, but they mightn't have won. You know, and then I guess the course of history would be very different. <laughs> A 
snabba själva när vi talade svin när vi utgör innan sändningen. When you're feeling all right, everything is up tight. Try to sing a song that goes ding, 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 You'll say your kisses for me. Say all your kisses for me. Bye bye, baby. Bye bye. Rock Bottom is the name of the song sung by Lindsay DePaul and Mike Moran, which you won't have seen winning the song for Europe last night. The contest took place at the new London theatre and was going to be seen by millions of viewers on BBC One. But minutes before airtime, it was blacked out because of an industrial dispute. Where are we? Rock bottom. Tragedies. We got a remedy. Why don't we rub, rub it out and start it again? Rock, rock. Someone that you never wanted to be All I offer is my solid love Those were the bad old days Before I had it Back in the 70s, Eurovision didn't have that kind of cheesy stigma about it it was still regarded with great affection and we always stood a good chance of being in the top five at least. At that time, I don't think we came any less than the top five. And we represented the UK in France, in Paris, and we were tipped to win. Singing the United Kingdom's entry at number eight with them, Alan Ainsworth, Coco. We came 11th, which at the time was the worst the UK had ever done, so I thought, I've let Queen and Country down, you know? I was quite depressed about it. Having said that, it was my childhood dream, so I had fulfilled the dream, even though it didn't match up to what, I, what I'd hoped. <laughs> Israel, 10 points. Israel, 12 points. Israel, 12 points. Israel, 12 points. However, it's not universally popular across the Arabic countries. As soon as it became obvious that Israel was going to win, Jordan decided to replace the transmission with a photograph of a vase of flowers. Later on Saturday, in international control rooms like this throughout Europe, all eyes will be on Jerusalem for this year's Eurovision Song Contest. Mary Ann, I'm gonna do what I can, but I can't do more than try. Tearing my heart out, trying to make it up to you. Mary Ann, I'm gonna do what I can, that's the truth, and that's the lie.
previous contest is being staged by Holland. From here in the Hongkreskebal at the Hague. The song 17, sung in English by Johnny Logan. I've been waiting such a long time. I was absolutely rooting for him. The song What's Another Year was a departure from the songs of that of that uh, era. What's another year? It was written by Shay Healy. He didn't write songs for a living. Who was a, a broadcaster, journalist. But the words of that song, I, I believe, came from a very personal experience. He, he heard someone say the phrase, and it struck a chord with him in his life. What's another year? He didn't sit down to write a Eurovision hit. And I do think you can, something in you knows that. I love it, Thomas, as you can see, there's Johnny Logan kissing Katya Epstein because he comes on stage now, Johnny Logan. He's going to be jumping like that for quite a while. Emotional performance from the winner, Johnny Logan. That Cheryl, Mike, Jay, and Bobby. And the venue is Dublin, where they're in competition with entrants from 19 other Eurovision countries. I was in the jury that year. And as soon as we heard Box Fizz, we went, that's the one. The Eurovision Song Contest, live from Dublin, starting at 8 o'clock tonight on BBC One. But do you think generally, because the stakes are so high now, that the Eurovision Song Contest is perhaps more important than it used to be? Because it gives you such an enormous kind of, uh, so many people see you, I think it's how many, 500 million? Mm -hmm. 500 yeah. million. That's such a, I mean, that's like the, the biggest amount of press and publicity you could ever get in, in an hour or so. The lady who put us together took a lot of time and she made sure all the details were right before we actually went together. He was the main ingredient, so we all had to be short and blonde. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I am five foot, I was five foot ten then. <laughs> what, well. in your dreams? We were one of the first manufactured bands, which at the time was scorned upon, but now, of course, it's kind of the norm. It's expected that protesters supporting the H Block hunger strikers will picket contestants before and after the concert. This report from Peter Gould. A police escort has been provided for the coaches bringing the performers to the exhibition centre where the song contest is being staged. Because it's IRA threat, when we were travelling anywhere, we went into our, in our own coach. We had two outriders and we were going through the red lights, not thinking of the danger, of not, the reason they were doing it, of being all. an IRA target. No, it's just we were thinking, whoa, this yeah. is really exciting, it's like being the Queen. But Fizz, the group performing the UK's entry, are one of the favourites to win. Blue, blue, blue Johnny Blue, I live singing dying. I said, uh, Germany are going to win this. And that German song was nice. It was competitive, definitely. I remember going in and putting my makeup on backstage. It was definitely a few dagger looks from other competitors, and I just gave them back. Of course, it's the most nervous you're going to be. Representing your country and it meaning so much. But we started, we did the um, Gusby, you know, then, oh, yeah. uh, then you know, mind up. And then Michael looked at me and went, Here we go. Here we go. And I thought, That's it, that's it. It's just Mike <laughs> Nolan and me and Jay and Bobby, and we're just doing, we're just having some fun. And that, you know, the skirts dance move was genius. You're making your mind Jay wanted short skirts because Jay is tiny. And so I didn't want to wear short skirts, I wanted to wear long. I've got footballer's legs. You know, it was getting on my nerves and I went, oh, let's have both. And if I remember rightly, it was the choreographer who said, that's perfect. But if you want to see some more, the rules of the game, we'll let you... The Box Fizz skirt was an enormous scandal, let me tell you, because Sex and nudity in Ireland was in its infancy then, and indeed has remained so, and rightly so. Box Fizz on the night sounded so bad. They were really woeful. But because we'd heard the song a lot, you know, it didn't, didn't matter. But if you were hearing it for the first time, that was not a winning performance.
The first country that gave us votes was Austria. Royaume-Uni, quatre points. United Kingdom, four points. Yes. And they said four, and I thought, well, we've got another 26 countries to go yet. Don't let's not panic. <laughs> United Kingdom, eight points. That's a United bit more Kingdom, like eight points. You've got lots of eights. We won only by about, what, three points? Four points. Four, four points. points. Yeah. Yeah, so it was Without that right Austrian four, we wouldn't have won. Heavens, heavens, they've done it again. But making your mind up, another win for the United Kingdom. I'll take a small bet that this might well go to number one in the British hit parade. And I was like a lunatic when we won, weren't yes, we? Yes, you were. <laughs> and you've never changed. Yes. <laughs> it's absolutely beside themselves. Estoy teniendo lluvia. Eurovision Song Contest. It's coming this year from the brand new multi million pound Harrogate Conference Centre in North Yorkshire. Bienvenue à Harrogate. Welcome to Harrogate. And this is the question on all Europe's lips tonight. Who are Harrogate? Who is Harrogate? <laughs> That's the place in North Yorkshire. Portugal want a ukulele. Who's doing that? Uh, yes, exhibition strokes. Do you think for the lads in the orchestra, I mean, it's obviously very hard work this week, I mean, rehearsing and uh, doing a live show, but do you think it's a challenge for them? Oh, yes, I think, I think they're very proud to do it because we consider ourselves to be the best. The Eurovision Song Contest is either a showcase for the best of international pop or a collection of instantly forgettable rearrangements of the same three chords, mostly sung in languages you can't understand. For one reason or another, the quality of the songs has now become something of a joke. This year's British entry, for instance, contains the immortal word Tukun, which is unlikely to appear in the new edition of Roger Thesaurus. Yeah, you're both gonna face it. Right? A, it's a very, very good song. And B, people seem to like us, which is really, really nice. And the routine and everything, the whole package for the song is so good. Um, I think we stand a really, really good chance. And it's exactly the same, but go around the other way. Uh, the other way. Yeah, so. and you look at her and, no, and you go that way. I got my first break last year when I was asked to do Bucks Fizz. And uh, I didn't really want to do it at first because I've never choreographed with singers. And it was, it was fun. It was. So exciting, you know, and then when they won. But it, it taught me this year, I think, that a gimmick always works. Bucks Fizz had won the 1981 Eurovision Song Contest with the gimmick of ripping the skirts off. And you can see in 1982 that this continues with a number of acts and it almost becomes a Eurovision dance competition. But ultimately, the contest was won by a girl soloist just sitting there, just performing the song straight to camera. It's a song about peace. You can't run over the stage from this side to the other side, so you have to concentrate on the, the lyrics, the message. I didn't see the audience, and I didn't want to know that 700 million of people are looking now. I'm inclined to think that uh, Britain's Bardo must have a very good chance with one step further. It's entirely significant that throughout the hundreds of years that I did the Eurovision Song Contest, I never once picked the winner. And Germany, 12 points. That's Ralph Ziegel there with Nicole. Hello, Jean. Hello, hello, Gay. Jerusalem calling. Nearly m most important for me, it was the point that um, a German girl with a song about peace got... 12 points from Israel. Germany, 12 points. Ralph took my hand and said, that's incredible. The first time Germany gets 12 points from Israel and we know our history. That was, ooh. Ein bisschen Frieden from Germany. I went to the stage again. We will hear a reprise of the winning song. And I sang it in four languages, but nobody knew that. I had five seconds from the first to the refrain. Should I, should I not, should I, should I not, should I, oh shit, I it. yes. <laughs> I will make it. 
I thought, okay, we're in England. What about English? A little love, a little giving to build a dream for the world we live in. So if you see the video, you will see the faces of my musicians. They looked at each other and said, what's, what's going on, what's going on? And then I turned to um, French. It's nearly six weeks now since the Israelis began their advance into Lebanon. Since then, international opinion against the war has hardened and Israeli casualties have mounted. I was invited to Tel Aviv to sing the songs in front of soldiers. It was a little bit dangerous, but I wasn't afraid. I, I knew I must do this. And all the soldiers, young people, girls and boys, sat down in front of me on a hill. And when I started singing, they put down their weapons and took each other's hand and listened. The wish in everybody's heart for peace was alive and I think it will be ever alive, this wish. Great applause for Germany's Nicole from Saarbrücken, 17 years of age. Marvellous victory. Welcome to the 28th Eurovision Song Contest in Munich. Israel, we point. As the vote started coming in, we were doing pretty well. United Kingdom, 12 Whoa, points. Whoa, we did. United Kingdom get the 12 points. When the, the votes are coming in, you've got cameras on your face and you've got to go, oh, yes, we've got 10 points, we've got two points. Oh, well, you know, never mind, we've got two points, but we're still happy. Not really. And finally, Luxembourg, 12 points. And when the vote started not to come in and Luxembourg started getting the 12s, you started noticing all the TV camera crews slightly moving away. For the fifth time, Luxembourg has won the Eurovision Song Contest. And finally, are you ready? Norway, 12 points. You surprise and astound me. I remember it very well. They won in the neighboring country, Sweden, which also gave it an, a special touch. Uh, they drove back to, to Oslo, and when they crossed the border to Norway, people cheered with flags all the way from the border and up to Oslo. It was a fantastic moment. Silly dressy up bing bongy bang idea, which has sort of took hold in the sort of, I suppose, from the 80s onwards, uh, where everyone sort of thought it was a bit of a joke and therefore we turned it into a bit of a joke. It's a great shame. Oh! Dear Johnny Logan, when you think that he won it twice, he should have been a bigger star than Elvis. Come on, Ireland. 
What do you say when words are not enough? Perhaps it's an indication of how lightly people take the Eurovision Song Contest. What can I say when my words are not enough? Good evening and welcome to Dublin, scene of the 33rd running of the Eurovision Song Contest. Who said it wouldn't last? Dublin, one of the great ones. I remember it above all for the presence of Bruce Forsyth, who I had invited to come. His daughter Julie had written our entry that year, Go, sung by Scott Fitzgerald. Go. Italy going to give the United Kingdom. They are 12 points to the United Kingdom. As the voting was proceeding, we were still in chances for the gold. There's five points in it, I can tell you, between the United Kingdom and Switzerland. So can Scott Fitzgerald hang on by the skin of his teeth, or will Celine Dion catch up? Everything depends on Yugoslavia. It went absolutely to the wire and came down uh, on the last vote to one point. Almania. You've got to get the 10 of the 12 one. to win it. Norway, 10 points. 10 points Norway, to Norway. Who's getting the 12? 10 points. <laughs> Look at Bruce Forsyth. Norvège, D. What a cliffhanger. And finally, France. <laughs> still in recovery from that moment. Just hit the United Kingdom with the closest finish I've ever seen at the Eurovision Song Contest. Pipped them by one point. There's the winner, Switzerland's Celine Dion. This one couldn't be anything else but Spanish. Azucar Moreno, bandido. When you're ready. I don't like it, it's going too smoothly. Listen, will I hum you the first couple of bars while we're waiting here? <laughs> We're applauding the tape technician now. Very nice. It has to be something, not something that somebody will either love or hate, something that everybody as a whole will like and get a good feeling from, so it can't be too unique in its style. What do you think your chances are in the contest? There is no contest. We've done it. <laughs> It's a really plucky thing to do, because you're an established star. <laughs> I mean, you'll be expected to win. That's what I mean. You oh, know. really? <laughs> I, I hope I do, but not, not the sort of reason that I'm doing it. I'm trying to work out the reason why I am doing it right now. I went for Michael Ball. I mean, he has a miraculous voice and fine good looks. I thought there was a winning 
combination. So I invited him to come to Television Centre to have a meeting with him uh, in order to propose that he should sing uh, the British entry. Um, I, I think there was a, a moment where it was almost palpable that the air was leaving his body uh, as he understood what I was saying to him. And he left my office uh, saying, of course, he would think about it, but that uh, I shouldn't hold my breath. One step at a time. Again, to my sad disappointment, we got the silver. We came second. It's Ireland that's won it for the fourth time. Fourth win for Ireland. The people the shape of the more adventurous demonstrators started climbing aboard, the army caved in. Whatever Mr Gorbachev decides, the people are unlikely ever again to allow the communist machine to dominate their lives. At that time, new nations uh, were uh, popping up like mushrooms, all of whom wanted to be in the Eurovision Song Contest. It's the Eurovision Song Contest tomorrow night. Time to send the brain away for the weekend. The competition's got used to the sneers, but for the first time in a long while, the organizers' claims about building international understanding through music are being taken at face value, at least by one small country. The Bosnian team has arrived with a song and a story to prick the conscience of Europe. Their entry, entitled The Whole World's Pain, was written and rehearsed under gunfire in Sarajevo. Two months ago, in the dead of night, they ran full pelt across the UN-controlled airfield in the city, braving sniper fire. You know, people risking their lives to take part in a TV show. It's a way of saying we're here. You know, despite all of this stuff that's going on, we're here and this is what we've risked to get there. Although the group made it, six other people were shot dead trying to escape that night. We are not here to use that tragedy in, in our country. It did sound a bit like it, that's why... Maybe I, for you, that, but that's, that's reality in my country. Yeah, but that's, then... That's happened, that's already happened. And that's happening now. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that. That's really happening. Yeah, I do believe yes. it, but then what happened if every other country would do the same? I mean, this should be... Oh, you are lucky. You haven't this problem in your country. Well, that deserves to get the biggest roar of the night. The Irish have always been tremendously enthusiastic about Europe. And, and certainly by taking part in the Eurovision Song Contest. I was yours and you were mine. And that's been reflected in the enormous success they've always had. I mean, they've won it more times than anybody else. They've won it three times in succession. If you listen to those songs, they're all kind of different. And I do think that perhaps that's why Ireland was very successful, because the writers weren't writing to win Eurovision they were writing what they found. Ireland have done it. They can do this, and they've won it for the third time in succession. Unprecedented. In the end, it became a sort of national panic because, you know, winning's great. But Ireland couldn't afford to stage this thing. Because, you know, in the beginning, we, you were able to just put a few cameras in a theater or do it in a convention center or something. But it just grew and grew, as did the price of putting it on. I still think the greatest Irish contribution to the Eurovision Song Contest was River Dance. It is still the best interval act there's ever been. Just extraordinary that it came from Nowhere, that Bill Whelan just came up with that music, which you assume you knew. 
You, you, the first time you heard that song, you just kind of thought, oh, this is obviously a traditional Irish song that they've just vamped up. No, he wrote it. It took what was an everyday experience for Irish people and turned it into something magical. Like, you know, one Irish dancer, you think, well, that's boring. So you think, a hundred Irish dancers, that'll be a hundred times more boring. But instead, just the, it was incredible. Good grief. That brought the folk memories out. This is Britain's attempt to bring the Eurovision Song Contest screaming into the 90s. The winner, Excellent. Eva Excellent. Quinn. We have been elected as New Labour and we will govern as New Labour. The Labour government, Tony Blair's government, won the election. So there was a kind of whole thing going on in the country at that point. Everybody was full of optimism, thinking, well, you know, and damn it, we're going to win the Eurovision Song Contest as well. I had to consider quite carefully the move to do the Eurovision Song Contest because we were aware of the obvious connotations of it being the kiss of death for an artist's career. And then the other comment we got from people was, you better win. I was going into it completely blindly because I'd never seen it before. So. I watched some of these tapes of Eurovision, and that was an eye-opener. You know, it kind of went from juggling acts to acrobatics, and I thought, well, this is just missing a couple of poodles and a clown. But when we got involved with it, and we saw how passionately some countries, they put forward their be very best music. There wasn't any leverage for being offhandish about it. We had to take it very seriously. It was suggested that I tone down my American accent. Uh, and I didn't know how I was gonna do that unless, you know, I ended up sounding like Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, can you imagine? Oh yeah, I mean, I've lived here for night since 1976, yeah. <laughs> From the second you're greeted at the airport, the enthusiasm was overwhelming. Hello, the point. And I thought, oh my God, this thing is huge. So was, I, I was walking into it thinking, no pressure. And all of a sudden I was thinking, oh my God, there's a colossal amount of pressure. Here we are in what is called the green room. Don't be fooled by the fact that it is blue. And we are now doing what um, you do an awful lot of when you're involved in the Eurovision Song Contest, and that is wait. Look, I'm sorry, but this is my favorite bit. Having sat through 23 other acts, they don't so much grow on you as they sort of lose their offensiveness. And so I was starting to get really attached to a lot of them, and I thought, Wow, now that's a really good Eurovision song. Oh, what the Russian one do? Prima donna, prima donna. So little by little, I was losing confidence, and I turned to the two backup singers, and I said, hey, how are you two so composed? And they turned to me and they go, beta blockers, darling. 
So, you know, you get out there and the music starts and I'm listening for the click and I just thought, well, now or never. Love shed light in every corner of my heart. Let the love light carry, let the love light carry. But it was, hands down, the most nerve-wracking and trouser-cacking two minutes and 58 seconds of my whole life. United Kingdom. That's the first Deux Bois. Hi, Mom and Daddy! Hi! It was just absolute delight. I mean, it was a show I had always wanted to do. Terry had always wanted to, to, to win it, so, I mean, he was ecstatic about it. First time since 1981. And then your life changes from there on, because you've won the Eurovision Song Contest. What a thing. A bitter row has erupted in Israel over the singer chosen to represent the country in the Eurovision Song Contest, which is due to be held in Birmingham. She's called Dana International, and until a sex change operation five years ago, Dana was a man. Orthodox Jews are outraged by her nomination. Some fanatics have even threatened to kill her. I represent liberal Israel, Israel that accepts human beings, whoever they are. We can talk a little Swedish. Can I go, Ben? Torche, torche, mahogany gas pipe. One of the things that I had obsessed about was just trying to make the show run to time and smoothly and sort out what has often been a mess at the end when there's a winner and they kind of, you know, you, nothing had takes ages to get them to the stage. So we'd rehearse that endlessly. Israel have won it by seven points over the United Kingdom. Dana International was declared at the winner and cued the fanfare. <laughs> And Dana is nowhere to be seen at all. Come on, quickly! Come on, quickly! Come on, quickly! Come on, quickly! Let's go, we must go where you're me on. You must go. She's decided to change her frock. I'm standing, talking to about 80 million people, with nothing in my head. In a long time! God knows what I said, I can't remember a single thing about it, but my whole life flashed in front of me. Take me to your heaven is the winner of the Eurovision Thank Song you. Contest 1999. Mazel Tov! That's International, of course, last year's winner. And there she was, pretending to fall and actually do it. Welcome, Europe! What no one can really ever get a handle on until you go is the scale of it. It felt almost like just a barn dance when we did it. It's become such a colossal affair. It's Estonia! Estonia. Thank you, Denmark! Thank you! It's a very big responsibility. It's not very easy for Estonia, but we will do it. Without no doubt, we will do it and we will do it well. Hello, Europe! Since it began, Eurovision has reflected the changing political map of Europe, and that continues to this day. Latvia! The expansion of the contest eastward injected new energies, but also saw the UK's fortunes in Eurovision really changing. Saddam Hussein is not cooperating with the inspectors and therefore is in breach of the UN resolution. Gemini came last and gained the dubious accolade of being the worst UK result ever. What about the political side of this? A lot of people were saying that this was about the Iraq war. I mean, we were told that there was some politics in, in um, the Eurovision, but hopefully, you know, we were hoping that we'd go there, give it our best shot, which we did. I think probably when we started to not do so well, was when, as a country, we thought, well, actually, if we don't take it seriously, then we won't be disappointed. 
as a nation, I think musically, you know, we are one of the finest in the world. And I think to not represent our country with that at, at the heart of what we're doing, I think, I think is a bit shameful, to be honest. I think certainly there is some resentment in Europe towards the UK, certainly amongst the national broadcasters. They make a lot of effort, they put in their biggest stars, and yet they see perhaps the UK entering novelty acts or songs that maybe don't reflect the wider UK charts. And I think there is perhaps a little bit of suspicion or frustration that, at the fact that we're not entering our best. Boots, leather, whips. What a winning combination. Ukraine. If you have a whole evening of songs, let's say you have 25 songs, and you have to decide what to vote for, you need what I would call a little anchor, something that you can remember it for. It's about how you can notch up any performance, whether it be a costume or a trick. You remember the guy with the funny hat, or the lady in the beautiful dress, or those guys with a monster mask on. I despaired of Eurovision that year. The true believers, thou shalt be saved. Brothers and sisters, keep strong in the faith. I thought that was a turning point, and I thought Eurovision going in the wrong direction. Congratulations. I think if you're trying to win it, then you're going to do daft things, right? Because it's about catching people's attentions for perhaps the wrong reasons. Sieben, sieben, ein und du. Ein, zwei, drei. Right? So you're going to, you know, you're going to have a jetpack, you know, or you're going to go ice skating, or, you know, you're going to have sharks or whatever it is, you know, you're going to do something which says, look at us, you know, we're going to be, we're going to make the biggest noise. Uh, that's if you want to win it. But I'm not sure that the winning of it is the point of it. It's over. And I can't say that we didn't predict it. This was going to be... Russia were going to be the political winners from the beginning. They'd always been block voting. The Scandinavians had always voted for each other. The Greeks had always voted for Cyprus. Cyprus had always voted for the Greeks. Nobody had voted for the United Kingdom. I think it's tremendously disappointing from the point of view of the United Kingdom. We've come joint last. But some really ridiculous songs that you have to say that this is no longer a music contest. What I do think is a big factor is the displaced voting factor. So I'm British, if I'm watching the show in the UK, I cannot vote for the UK entry. If I were to happen to be in Spain on the night of the show, I could vote for the UK entry in Spain. So countries whose populations are spread into other countries in bigger numbers, are likely just naturally to be able to vote for their own country elsewhere. Yes, they're voting for their neighbours, but they're also voting for a song that's been played to death on their radio. They probably know the person who's singing it because they're a star in their country. So it's not as simple as, we always vote for this country. That does go on. But I think normally it's about you vote for songs that you're familiar with because, you know, the more you hear any song, the more you like it until you grow to loathe it. Can you stop me if I just believe and we believe in you? When I was asked, obviously I wanted to do it. But it's scary because, you know, Sir Terry had done it forever. It was getting flights off. We went to Moscow. It's all, ooh, isn't this exciting? And it was just as the opening credits went, it dawned on me. Ooh, this is going to be coming out of someone's telly in a minute. Good evening and welcome to the Eurovision Song Contest 2009. And you don't want to mess it up. And there's no script. So you are just talking. I'm Graham Norton. I'm, I'm Miss Terry too. I'm sorry. And really, I think that first year, I was doing a Terry Wogan impression. <laughs> I was like, what would Terry say? <laughs> it's all right. You've let the dog back into the living room. It's all over. 
You see it on television, you see there's, you know, 15,000 people in a stadium and the, the set is enormous and everything. But what you don't see is all the sneaky things, like uh, someone will be doing an amazing vocal. You have to sing live. But of course, nothing's stopping you from miming to a backing singer. And if you look, you can see them. And that's, well, it's not cheating, but it, it's cheating. Song number 12 for the United Kingdom. Good luck to Josh Dubovic. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure the UK could win again. I, 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 every year I feel pity for the UK because you have so much good pop music. I think it's extraordinary that the, that the UK has not done better if One Direction decided to do Eurovision or if Chris Martin from Coldplay thought it would be a laugh to do Eurovision. Not just a laugh, actually, I could see Chris doing it and taking it quite seriously. Then the UK could win it very easily. So graceful and pure, a smile bathed in light, no matter. I think to represent in the in the modern sense of the word with a Z, uh, you know, it's it's an important it's an important thing. So fine if that's how you want it to be. Why don't we just turn up with something beautiful and amazing, uh, and then if we win or we don't win, you know, the, that doesn't matter. That's not what we're there for. We're there to say this is what we can do. It's a miracle. Copenhagen last year was extraordinary. They had chosen a massive derelict shipyard on an island. Inside it, they built the arena seating, a lighting grid. They made the whole back wall out of LED screen material. And all of this was controlled by computer software so that when a song was running, the cues for the screens, the lights, the visual effects, and even the cutting of the cameras were all controlled off this software system. And it ran like clockwork. They did a really, really good job. I was standing on the stage and I was fighting my tears because I always wanted to be there. Waking in the rubble, walking over glass. And I thought, I'll do this for myself. I don't care about anyone here. I sing and I entertain myself. And if they think it's ridiculous, so what? I have a great time. You wouldn't know me at all today. As far as Austria are concerned, what an amazing thing to do in an international arena. To put someone forward to say, this is our person that, you know, that you need to take seriously. People didn't really know who or what Conchita was. Was Conchita a woman? Was Conchita transgender? Was Conchita a drag queen? Conchita is a drag queen with a beard. Nothing more, nothing less. Some broadcaster said, OK, well, we're not going to show that song. Uh, we're going to opt out for those two and a half minutes. And hats off to the EBU. Um, they said, no, no. You either show the whole thing or you don't show it at all. And in the end, everyone caved. They have their own opinion and that's fine with me. If they don't like it, I'm totally cool with that. They just have to respect that I'm here. Like, we have to respect one and each other. None of us expected Conchita to win. You know, we all said to each other beforehand, wouldn't it be great if, but of course that's not going to happen because all those Eastern European countries won't vote for, you know, the bearded drag lady. Um, but of course, happily, we were wrong. 
We have done the math. It's no secret anymore. Yes. We are ready to announce the winner. The winner is <laughs> Austria. I just feel so honored that I'm the person who was standing in center of attention, you know, because I love to be in the center of attention. But um, especially when it comes to that, of course, for me, it was very important not just to stand and sing there, but also take this opportunity to say something. This night is dedicated to everyone who believes in a future of peace and freedom. You know who you are. We are unity and we are unstoppable. Conchita's victory was hugely symbolic. The public, maybe not the juries, but the public voted for Conchita. We were crying, you know, we were crying. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it just, it felt important. It just felt that people, the people who live in places, the people who go to the shops, and the people who just live their lives had spoken, and they were nicer people and more tolerant people than their governments let us think. Even though we've managed a great deal of integration in Europe, especially since uh, the Second World War, uh, we're, we're still not there yet. There are still a lot of differences between countries. We still don't fully grasp the depth of all our cultures, and we have to keep evolving. I think Europe as a project is never ready, just like the Eurovision Song Contest as a project is never ready. It's the only pan-European cultural event and it brings nations together like no other event. We laugh, we sing, uh, we party. <laughs> Eurovision will always be unique because you're voting for countries, and that's what gives it, I mean, gravitas is a big word, but that is kind of what gives it a, a certain level of seriousness. I think anything that brings people together, we shouldn't knock it because there's so much that divides. Nowadays, you know, where we have to struggle with so many difficult things that happen all around the world, it's good to don't forget to celebrate life. I hope people understood that I always looked upon it with a kindly eye. And long may it last. That was great. Thank you very much. Smash it. Thank you. Thanks. Mon cœur est gravé dans mes chansons, coupé de cire.